The Chitra Sutra, the ancient Indian treatise on sculpture and painting, states that the purpose of art is to show us the grace which underlies all of creation. To help us on the path towards reintegration with the Divine. From the 4th century onwards, the human form became the main embodiment of philosophic concepts. These exquisite forms were made to move us and to transport us beyond our worldly concerns to that which was more important. Temples were conceived as homes for the deity, where the formless eternal takes on a shape to give darshan to the devotee. Darshan is the transfer of grace which occurs when we look upon the beauty and harmony of the divine. Many temples were made in the Gupta period from the 4th to the 6th centuries AD. However, most were made of brick and have not survived. The earliest large body of well-preserved temples is of the period of the early Chalukyas from the 6th to the 8th centuries. These were made near the banks of the Malaprabha River in present-day Karnataka and on the Tungabhadra in Andhra Pradesh. The Chalukyas rose to power in the mid-6th century and made their capital at Badami. The earliest monument of their rule is the Ravan Pari cave at Aihole, not far from Badami. It was probably made around 550 AD and is dedicated to Shiva. The red sandstone cliffs of Badami offered a spectacular setting for the excavation of four caves, three Hindu and one Jaina. The largest and most impressive of these is Cave 3, dedicated to Vishnu. An inscription next to a Varaha depiction states that the cave was dedicated in AD 578 by Mangalesha, a brother of King Kirtivarman. Many Chalukyan monuments were patronized by members of the royal family. Stepping inside, we are transported to another world. Large figures of the forms of Vishnu are made in panels along the walls. We see a continuation of the sculptural styles of the rock-cut caves of the Western Deccan. However, the figures have become more slender. There is an elegance of the post-Gupta period and a distinct Chalukyan style is seen. Here Vishnu is seated in a posture of royal ease on the cosmic serpent Ananta, which means endless. Vishnu is seen in the Narasimha of Tara, part human and part lion. Pillars of the Mandapa are elaborately carved with Kirti Mukhas and other motifs. Mithunas or loving couples represent the creative forces and the harmony of the natural order. The cave has surviving fragments of 6th century paintings which are extremely valuable as a record of the art of that time. 
It is known that the walls and ceilings of most early Indian monuments would have been fully painted. A distinctive feature of the caves and temples of this period are the elaborately carved ceiling panels as we see in Cave 2 here. A panel of gunners is made across the basement in front of the cave. The Varaha of Tara of Vishnu was the dynastic symbol of the Chalukyas. In this form, the Lord appears as a boar to rescue the earth goddess from being submerged in the ocean. So I was first looking at the buildings, but very quickly I realized that the architecture could not be separated from its sculptural, its carved portions. Actually, the bulk of the carvings are inseparable from the buildings. And this integration, I would say, of carved figures and carved ornamentation, this decor of beautiful decorative motifs, is something which is, I think, the speciality of these monuments. Cave One is dedicated to Shiva and is also of the mid-sixth century. Projections of the rock face, at right angles to the front of the cave, continue the sculptural program. To the right of the entrance is a magnificent depiction of the Nataraja, Shiva in the cosmic dance. We see here the movement and the multiplicity of the world of creation, yet all held together in the great harmony of the natural order. The grace of the figure continues the styles which were established in the preceding century, in the Gupta period. I think this warm and full bodied sort of carving is something which is very special about early Chalukya art. It's a product, of course, of the soft sandstone that permits a very rounded way of modeling the figure. The expressions on the faces are rather otherworldly. You feel that however violent or however active the figures may be, the, um, the expressions are in another world. There is a depiction of Durga as Mahishasur Mardani, when she kills the demon of ignorance in the form of a Mahisha or buffalo. The large buffalo appears like a toy in her hands. The region of the Malaprabha River in the Deccan was a meeting place of the styles of temple building which were developing in North and South India. While temples of other regions have been lost, examples are preserved here because little or no building has taken place in later times. Aihole is today a small village in a remote part of Karnataka state. Many of the temples here were used, until recently, as houses or cattle sheds and are known by the names of their former owners. For instance, the temple of Lad Khan, which was probably built around the end of the 6th century. An inscription states that it was dedicated to Durga. It has a large porch with fine figures carved on the pillars. Within is a simple square hall in which the windows create a striking effect. Anandi, the bull on which Shiva rides, is a later addition. A small second story with sculptures of Shiva and Vishnu is part of the original conception. The Durga temple, most probably of the early 8th century, is apsidal in form. The shape is perennial, 
though not very common in Indian monuments. The temple also has a very unusual and open ambulatory around the sanctum, with pillars and no wall on the outside. There are splendid images of Shiva and Durga here. The quality of naturalism is striking. In the art of this period, the emphasis has come on relatively fewer but major images made in niches. These are isolated from others and are not made in crowded groupings. The northern style of the Shikhara and the treatment of the sculpture suggest affinities to the temples of Alampur, which were made around the same time. Parts of present-day Andhra Pradesh state had come under the control of the Chalukyas in the 7th century. Here at Alampur are nine temples called Nava Brahma temples in a later 16th century inscription. These were made at the end of the 7th or the early 8th century. Eight of these are made in the Nagara or Northern style. These are among the finest temples of the Chalukyan period and the most beautiful of them is the Svarga Brahma, constructed in the end of the 7th century in honour of a queen by her son. The exterior walls of the temple have latticed windows and niches containing deeply cut figures. The central niche has an image of the deity who is to be represented in that direction. The mithunas or loving couples are finely made on either side. They display the soft modelling and beauty of form which continues from the Gupta and post-Gupta period. The temples of Patadakkal are on the Malaprabha River, a few kilometres from Aihole. These mark the return of Chalukya temple patronage to Karnataka after several years of activity in the Andhra Pradesh region. The first great temple here is the Galagnatha, which is in the northern style and is similar to the Alampur temples. It is in the Virupaksha temple that we encounter the full glory of art under the early Chalukyas. The temple was built in 735 AD by Lokeshwari, a queen of King Vikramaditya II, to celebrate his victory over the Pallavas of Kanchipuram. It was probably modelled after the Kailashnatha temple at Kanchipuram, which had greatly impressed the king. The Virupaksha would also have served as a model for the Kailashnatha temple built at Ellora by the Rashtrakutas, who succeeded the Chalukyas. The temple is the largest of this period. Its compound walls enclose a complex of 30 sub-shrines in the courtyard and a large Nandi Mandapa. Shiva rides on Nandi the bull, who is always found close to him. This pavilion housing Nandi was to become a continuing tradition in Shiva temples. The Virupaksha, along with the Kailashnatha at Kanchipuram, was probably the largest and most ornate temple in India at that time. The structures are all made of the local red sandstone and elaborately carved. The walls of the temple have 35 niches with images of Shiva.
the figures that are represented respect the, um, I would say, movements and proportions of human beings. But we have to understand that when it came to depicting gods, the purpose of art was not to portray the god just as an ordinary human being, but to take, I would say, elements of the human anatomy and charge them with a sublime and divine quality. And this sometimes gave them a very formal quality. Eighteen pierced windows serve to light the vast interior hall. The hall has four rows of pillars which divide the space into aisles. The interior of the Virupaksha temple presents a world of sumptuous carvings. Scenes from the epics are carved on the pillars. There are many figures in dynamic compositions. The work is miniaturized but extremely detailed. With light filtering in from windows and the distant doorway, the effect is dramatic. These artists who worked, especially in Badami and Patadakal, seem to have been attracted to an area of art which is somewhere between figural and somewhere between fantasy on floral. And so you have figures that dissolve into fantasy or into floral forms. You get this marvellous sort of fantastic world in which we have part circles and inside the part circles you have figures but they're dissolving into sort of floral forms and no two are the same. So this inventiveness, this sort of infinite range of possibilities is something which we find in the sculptors and it's something I think which is perhaps unsurpassed in the history of Indian carving. The sanctum enshrines the Shivalinga, made of black stone. In the Indic tradition, deities are adored. They are offered fresh flowers, cool water, lamps and incense. Mithunas or loving couples are auspiciously placed in the temple and the porches. They remind us always of the fruitfulness and of the harmony of nature. A shrine next to the sanctum has an image of Durga as Mahisha Surmardani, slaying the buffalo demon. There is a great naturalism in the nimble Durga, who stabs the Mahisha, whose only buffalo feature is his horns. Even in the midst of the drama of the moment, there is a marvellous sense of detachment, as she looks away and not at the demon. The Mahisha is on his knees, in a pose which conveys as much reverence as defeat. The fact that sculptors can portray and communicate to the onlooker, to the devotee, that the gods inhabit a world beyond activity and aggression. It's something which we can meditate on. How they do it, of course, is one of the miracles of art, but something to do with the way in which the face is treated, the eyelids are lowered, it's the softness of the modeling of the features of the face as well as the swelling, the sort of fullness of the body and this um, sort of compression of form that we have in Indian art um, I think is always something very noticeable in this period it makes it one of the great highlights of the history of Indian sculpture. The sculptural figures are dynamically posed. This vitality and movement is seen in the 8th century in temple art across many parts of India, including Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan and Orissa. Dwarapalas seen here have a remarkable similarity with those of early Chola temples, a hundred and fifty years later. One of the attractive and I would say characteristic aspects of early Chalukya sculpture in the 7th and 8th centuries is the fact that 
figures are represented in various activities because they are depicting gods in the various incarnations and sometimes these activities are quite um, violent or you know quite aggressive but always the faces are detached the malikarjuna temple was made by treloka mahadevi also a queen and the sister of loka mahadevi who built the virupaksha temple it is also made in the dravid style of south india it is similar to the virupaksha the smaller and not very well preserved of the four temples with nagara shikharas the largest by far is the papanatha it was probably made after the virupaksha in the early 8th century the richly decorated interiors continue traditions of the deccan further south in tamil nadu temple interiors remained starkly unadorned till a much later date ceiling panels are the distinctive and among the most beautiful features of the early chalukyan temples this nataraja or shiva as a cosmic dancer is seen on the ceiling of the malikarjuna temple this fine shiva depiction is on the ceiling of the mandapa of the papanatha temple this feature was taken up in the later temples of Rajasthan and Orissa by the period of the early chalukyas in the deccan the indian temple was fully developed on its outer walls and in the sacred interior were depictions of great beauty and grace In Indian thought the moment of the aesthetic experience is considered to be akin to brahmananda or the final bliss of salvation itself When we respond to the grace of creation presented to us in art we come out of ourselves and experience a greater reality